way to order for life message is titled Being Spiritual. Being Spiritual. I have something here from Dr. Joseph Murphy, the great Dr. Joseph Murphy's book, The Miracle of Mind Dynamics. He writes, A girl said to me that all she desired was to be spiritual. That is the overall desire of just about everyone. But our terminology is not the same. When you are really spiritually minded, you are expressing yourself fully here and now. You realize that an automobile is a spiritual idea in the front of your door. A sandwich when you are hungry is an answer to your prayer and is spiritual also. If you sing while on stage, it is just as spiritual as a man singing the 23rd Psalm in the choir. The man who repairs the roof of your house is performing spiritual labor just as well as a minister, a priest, or a rabbi who may be reading a text from the Bible or broadcasting a sermon. Realize that the spirit and body are one. Cease looking down on your nose at material things. Stop once and for all separating the spirit of God from the flesh and blood of the world. Every physical act no matter how base you may consider it, is the living spirit within you, animating material form. You are not degraded or demeaned when you scrub a dirty floor or clean stables. If you are condemning anything in this world, you are demoting and depreciating yourself. That's from the great Dr. Joseph Murphy from his book, The Miracle of the Mind Dynamics. Now, I use this excerpt from Dr. Murphy's book as this statement has come to me very often during the past decade of responding to prayer requests on the Internet. Too often, as Dr. Murphy explains, there is confusion in just what being spiritual means. I believe to be spiritual is to reflect the spirit in our life experiences. That is the spirit within us. The things of the spirit are happiness and love and joy and peace and harmony and beauty and intelligence and wisdom and strength. We realize all of these are within us, within our heart, within our mind, and within our soul. Yet we know that most often these are experienced through the simulation of things that are material or are not realized due to conditions, circumstances, and situations in the material or the physical world. It is impossible for the human mind to fully conceive a spirit as omnipresent and so let us think about infinite presence, everywhere presence, just like the air that we breathe. There are people who are so consumed with the thought of allergens, deaths, etc., that they can't breathe without effort. And there are people who say that they are spiritual who live in poverty and lack. Why is this? I think it has a lot to do with how we have been mesmerized in accepting false ideas about our relationship to life itself. Buddhism teaches that desire is the root of all suffering and problems, and therefore teaches that we are to repress desire, so that we can realize peace and harmony within. <clears throat> but how long does our peace and harmony last when we can't pay the rent, or when we realize that the world is filled with abundance while we experience a stark life of lack and limitation. Spirit is creative, and this means to do, to be, or to have something, and in order to live spiritually, we must get in the spirit of the thing, get into the spirit of the thing that we choose to experience. Lack of desire can cause dullness, and for us to resign ourselves to lack, in fact, or at best, living with less than we are capable of experiencing. Spirit is abundant life, and the more of this abundance we experience, the more fuller our expression of life will be. It's up to us. It's up to us. The more fuller expression of the spirit we are reflecting in our lives means that we are allowing the spirit to move through us, to move through our mind, our heart, and our soul, to allow us to do things that are wonderful, things that make us feel, feel connected to the world in which we live. Most of us want to feel that. We want to feel that 
that greater light of the of the universe, that greater light of the spirit. You know, in the glossary of the science of mind and spirit, the great American mystic Ernest Holmes gives us these words regarding light. He writes, In flashes of illumination, the inspired have seen into the very center of reality and have brought back with them a distinct impression of what they have seen and felt. A glimpse of this reality illumines the whole being with a flood of light. Every mystic has had this experience. Jesus was the greatest of all mystics, and once, at least, after a period of illumination, his face was so bright that his followers could not look upon it. In moments of deepest realization, the great mystics have sensed that one life flows through all, and that all are some part of that life. Now, think about that. In moments of deepest realization, the great mystics have sensed that one life flows through all. Think about the air that we breathe. Let's say you're in a room full of people. You inhale, you exhale. And you know those same people are going to inhale the air that you exhale because we're all in this together. There's one spirit, one life, and we're all living this together. So let's continue with what uh, Ernest Holmes wrote here. He says, They have also seen substance a fine, white, brilliant stuff forever falling into everything, a substance indestructible and eternal. At times, the realization has been so complete that they have been actually blinded by the light. It was the first great revelation of divine creative energy that called all living things into being. Let there be light, and there was light. There is healing light in the rays of the sun, which we term a physical light. There is healing power in the wonderful high-powered lamps, but how much greater is the healing power which Jesus recognized in himself and in others? He said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I have set thee to be a light. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. The sons and daughters of God, without rebuke, ye shine as lights in the world. Ye shine as lights in the world. Well, think about that. Think about what that means, that, that we have this light within us. Because light is synonymous with intelligence. We all have intelligence. We all have the ability to choose how we're going to live this thing called life, what we're going to do with the things that come to us. We know that there are people that do wonderful things with their lives and then there are people that struggle to even even feel good about their lives we 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 can't we cannot we cannot allow ourselves to be caught up in the craziness of the world we can't there's a collective consciousness that believes in so many false ideas and so many false things that should we allow ourselves to believe them there's no way we can have a good life. There's no way we can have a joyful life. There's no way we can have a peaceful life. There is good for us, and we ought to have it. That's the, that's the claim of the, the greatest teachers of life that we can, we can draw, draw, draw on. You know, we must feel the, the urgency within ourselves to believe in something greater than what we see. We must feel the urgency to believe in ourselves that we have what it takes to live our life, to meet those things that we choose to have in our life, to meet those things that we choose to be in our life, to meet those things which we we choose to be active in our life. And we all want to be healthy. We all want peace of mind. We all want prosperity in our affairs, whether it's in our personal life or our business. We want to be able to live a normal and natural life that brings us into the realization that life is good. Life is good all the time. Life is good all the time. But do we allow ourselves to believe that? 
uh, Christianity has perpetuated a false teaching that leads many to believe that they are to reject material possessions and seek to be of service to others. Instead, this false idea is derived from the Gospel of Luke. Luke 18, 18 through 25, And a ruler asked him, Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, why did he say that? He didn't say that wealth was bad in itself. He said that people worship their money. They worship their wealth. They rely on it as their security. There are people... And we see these people in the news and on television almost every day. They think of money as their security. They think money can, can, if they have enough money, they can do whatever they want. They can do whatever they want to other people. We see that. That's the kind of thing Jesus was saying. Believe in yourself enough that if you lost everything today, that you could get it all back, that you could demonstrate it again in your life, that you could make manifest that which you have lost, that which you have given up, even more, even more, a hundredfold more, maybe. But we have to believe that we can do it. Otherwise, we do feel, we do fear the loss. We do fear not having money. We do fear losing the things that we have. But the mastermind Jesus gave us the key to increase. He gave us the key. If we can understand it. If we can understand it. Because we can't rely on just one teaching of Jesus. Because we don't have the consciousness that he had to understand what he was saying. It's like if somebody was speaking Greek to you, would you understand the word they said? But then they may be speaking the highest truth that you could know of. But if we don't understand it, we don't understand it. Jesus said, I have come to teach you that you may have life and you may have it abundantly. And we can find in Matthew 25, For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And so we realize that this lesson is not about rejecting wealth and material possessions, but instead is about our willingness to depend on that part of God within us, that wisdom, that strength, that spirit, that intelligence within us. We must depend on this principle that God is the law of God and God is the same thing. God is law and the law is God. The law of mind, the law, the principle that says whatever we put into our mind as the truth and keep faith with it and know that it's the truth because intelligence, intelligence tells us it is, that we can demonstrate manifest whatever it is that we choose to have, to do, or to be. The mastermind Jesus was simply testing the rich young man who professed to have great faith, if indeed he had the faith that God would restore to him the material possessions he would give up in order to follow Jesus. In reality, Jesus was asking him to follow his teachings, to believe that what he had came what, what he had came to him from God, and that it, this realization, he can have it all again. Because if you believe that it's you and your humanness 
that brings you your possessions, your your titles, your your occupation, whatever, and then you're probably not going to have a great deal of any of them or a great deal of success. We must know that there's something within us, something within us that makes these things work for us. Just as Jesus said, the Father works, Father meaning the principle, the principle, the law of God, is God. The Father works and then I work. The Father works and then I work. In other words, he goes within to the kingdom of God within himself and finds that intelligent idea, that intelligent word that he can speak that will draw to him that which he desires to have drawn to him. And in his statement, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, we can realize that just as a person who wants to be spiritual eschews material wealth and possession, people with wealth, Jesus believed, pretty much accepted the same false idea that there is a separation of omnipresent good, which can never be true. God is. God is. God is principle. And God is all in all. And all is God, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. Always present, everywhere present, omnipotent, always powerful, the only power there is. And omniscient, always intelligent. Not intelligent, but intelligence itself. <clears throat> God is in and through everything that is. Everything that is. Think about these words. You don't hear these words much in Christian churches. The kingdom of God is within you. And it's not low here or low there, Jesus said. And this means that we are not to give power to anything or anyone but this God within us. This part of God within us. God is life. If we're alive, we're part of God. Every living thing is part of this life source that we call God. And in this knowing that all power is in the Spirit, we never need lack for any good thing. It is the consciousness that accepts. All that the Father hath is mine. All that the Father hath is mine. Think about those words. All that the Father hath is mine. And that's incredible to think about it doesn't mean that we are going to get everything. We can only get what our consciousness can accept, but it means that everything is available, that we don't, we're not taking anything away from anyone else by having the good things that we desire. It's foolish to think we would. It's foolish to think it would even be possible for us to do that. There are so many things so many things <clears throat> that we can do to make life wonderful and, uh, and happy and joyous and harmonious. But we have to do it knowing that it's part of, it's part of our life experience to express the divine, our divine self, our intelligence, our spirit, our power. It's up to us. You know, there are people who live their entire lives reacting to people based on conditions, and if certain people do not meet their conditions, then they shut them out of their lives and often don't even show them the commonness of courtesy such as gratitude and respect. And for many of these people, this has become a lifelong habit. And they never realize that all they do or in most cases don't do, they are doing to themselves. And many of these people consider themselves to be religious or spiritual, and they may even talk about unconditional love like they actually know what it was or is. But unconditional love can only be a part of someone who understands and practices what Jesus taught as recorded in the book of John and what we read in the Bhagavad Gita before him. Everything and everyone in our lives is coming to us 
as an expression of God, as the spirit of God in physical form. If we could only get that in our mind and accept it and believe it, wonderful, beautiful things could happen to us. Without us, without us having absolutely no reason, <clears throat> but just our faith, just our faith to know it, to believe it. You know, Ernest Holmes, from the teaching of Jesus, he said, "If we wish to come to the Spirit for the healing of our wounds, let us come in peace and with spontaneous joy." for the spirit is joy. And we should realize there is great joy in knowing that as we turn to this infinite spirit, we turn within. We turn within. Because that's where it is. The kingdom of God is within you. Just as Jesus said, count on it. Believe in it. Know that it's so. Know that your mind, your mind, your attitude towards life, your thoughts about life, all the things all the things that go through your mind in a day's time, the dominant thoughts that rest with you in your mind each day, those become reality for you. In the book of Job, it is written, that which I have greatly feared has come upon me. His faith was in the morbid or the negative. Job could just as easily stated, that which I have greatly loved has come upon me, had his thoughts and meditations been filled with faith and hope in the good. So incredible that people don't believe this, that our thoughts and words carry just magnificent power. Even when we think we are powerless, we are powerful. Not one word passes through our lips that does not give power to something that is unfolding in our experience. The same is true of our thoughts. It would be impossible to monitor our every word and every thought, but we can discipline ourselves to correct our words and our thoughts fairly easily. As we begin and end each day, it is highly beneficial that we meditate upon the good things that we have, the good things that we want to have, and the things we want to experience. As we take the time, to think on these things, we begin to identify with the reality of them. And as we become comfortable with them, we begin to feel them as part of us. And when we begin to feel that the good we desire is a part of us, the good begins to unfold in our experiences. The more of the truth that we expose our mind to, the more of truth will become resident in our consciousness. And it is the truth. As the radical rabbi Jesus stated, that will set us free from our trouble. We must know the truth. We must know the truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, but we must also permeate our consciousness with the truth. For there will be times for all of us when our reliance on the truth may be the very thing, the only thing, that is necessary to move us through some condition or situation in our life. It's up to us. You know, it is written that the Brahma, that is the Brahma being the name of the Creator in Hinduism, was asked what was the cause of the world's troubles, and Brahma stated it was ignorance of the truth. Teach the truth, he said, and you will teach people to be free. This was recorded 5,000 years before Jesus. So what is the truth? The truth is always an affirmation of love and life. Affirming the good is affirming the presence of the Spirit of God in all things. All things. So let's know and let's believe. Let's accept. Don't let the things of the world manipulate us into believing that, that there's not good for us. And I drove by a church and read on their signboard, signboard, the signboard, I should say, don't condone what God has condemned. 
And I thought, oh my goodness, God does not condemn. Mankind condemns. Religion condemns. The Spirit of God does not. In Scripture we can read, He knows no iniquity. And the mastermind Jesus stated, Judge not lest ye be judged. So how can a church say that God condemns something? A God that condemns the God made in the image of man. And this is abhorrent to the truth. But let's not get sidetracked by false beliefs or we may lose sight of that spontaneous joy that we can know when we realize, as did Jesus, that the kingdom of God is within us. Let's think about these words from the great Ernest Holmes. This is from his Meditation for Supply. So let's think about these words and think about them with confidence and with faith. He writes, and we can affirm this, because we have everything we have to, we can't say, oh, there's a, a lot of money in the universe. That's not going to get us any money. We have to personalize it, personalize it, just like Jesus said, I am the light. I am. He's speaking from the God within him. He's speaking from his God self, not his human self. I am the light. So we have to say, I always have an abundance of money and an abundance of whatever it takes to make my life happy and opulent. There is a continuous movement toward me of supply of money of all that I need to express the fullest life, happiness and action. So if we can get into this and get into this and make it a realization within our own heart, mind, and soul, we shall be living a spiritual life filled with happiness and joy, love and peace, harmony and confidence, faith and wisdom, enjoying the best of times and the best of everything that the creative spirit within us has brought to our mind, has brought to our mind.